Ladies and gentlemen, ladies and gentlemen, I'm delighted to see you here this evening. My name is Volker Wieland. I'm managing director of the Institute for Monetary. Come in. Delighted to have you here. Um, so I'm the managing director of the Institute for Monetary and Financial Stability. This is quite strong, this mic, so I get to speak very, um, not very loud. Um, so anyway, fantastic to have you all here. Um, I'm going to actually quickly introduce two people. Um, first of all, before I, before I come to our uh, speaker tonight, I also want to welcome Axel Weber, who is sitting up here, who is uh, very well known here, right, as former president of the Bundesbank and uh, went off to Switzerland to UBS and we see that your work was very successful as now UBS has grown even bigger. So and, um, anyway, I'm amazed you're here today. I thought maybe you're, but we don't want to go into details. Uh, <laughs> it went really quickly in Switzerland, I must say. It's amazing. But, uh, but anyway, it's not, not funny, but, but that's how it is. Uh, we also had the ECB watchers yesterday, and of course the topic of financial stability and multi-stability was very big. Um, and uh, some people talked about a separation principle. We will see how long that separation principle will last. But anyway, why I wanted to mention Axel right up front for two reasons. Um, we are absolutely delighted uh, that he has actually agreed to be uh, president of the House of Finance following uh, Otmar Ising and uh, is very active helping us to uh, you know, increase our reach, have more impact. So we're tremendously thankful, grateful, and also that you on your way uh, f flew in today and, uh, and joined this evening um, here with us and that you will be um, moderating the question and answers. And so let me come to our, and you and Nouriel, but you'll probably say something about that. You know each other for a long time. So let me come to our speaker, Nouriel Rubini, who's also very well known here uh, for many reasons. Um, we're delighted to have you here. We already heard quite a bit uh, yesterday over in the uh, big hall. And, um, but today, it's this evening, we get more of a deep dive into the mega threats you have been writing about recently, and uh, we have a lot of opportunity to, for questions and answers. Um, so it's not going to be like, you know, and people like me or so give a talk with lots of slides. It's going to be right to the point. He's going to paint a big picture for you, but we get to answer, uh, ask a lot of questions. Uh, Nouriel is a, a, a true citizen of the world. He's uh, born originally in Istanbul, lived as a child briefly in Tehran, in, uh, um, in Israel, in Tel Aviv, then longer in Italy. Um, he um, later studied at Bocconi. I also saw that you became Bocconi Bocconi man or Bocconi student of the year in 2009, but um, anyway, then went to the U.S., uh, did his Ph.D. at Harvard, Jeffrey Sachs, um, was your advisor. I remember as a student uh, meeting you when you were uh, visiting Stanford or Hoover, and you had done work on macro models and all that stuff, but uh, moved, moved further from that. And... Um, You've been a professor also at Yale, but a long time at the Stern School, now in Emeritus. And uh, there's one other uh, story I wanted to quickly share. Um, Michael Binder, my colleague, uh, who is also here, he, in 2005, uh, I think he invited you for an event here. And um, it was a special event because we had just started the Deutsche Bank Prize in Financial Economics, which unfortunately doesn't exist anymore. But uh, uh, the first prize was given to Eugene Fama. You know Eugene Fama from uh, finance and eventually winner of the Nobel Prize. And Michael had organized a conference kind of in honor of uh, Eugene Fama, but also with the idea that, we might, that people might criticize or look at his ideas and the efficient market hypothesis from different directions. And, and Nouriel Rubini was one of the speakers. So going back to 2005, it's kind of stayed absolutely in my mind because it turned into a very interesting uh, event, uh, especially when Nouriel stepped up to the podium in 2005 and then started talking about what he thought was going wrong in financial markets and excessive debts and uh, excessively uh, uh, risen housing prices and and Eugene Fama, sitting further back, was getting you know, more and more restless, and 
And that can't be. And you know, I gave his own talk later on and thoroughly disagreed uh, with, uh, with Nouriel uh, about his views of what's going wrong. Um, and even though Eugene Fama won the Nobel Prize in 2013 together with, with Lars Hansen and I think Robert Schiller, right, if I'm right, um, certainly in 2005, who turned out uh, correct uh, was Nouriel Rubini, and so that has remained uh, ingrained with me. So a little story from way back there, probably uh, many others like that. Uh, but so without uh, going into more detail, you're much, much more interested in hearing from Nouriel. So I'll hand over to you. And uh, Axel will uh, round things up and give you uh, more, more questions and answers uh, afterwards. So, <laughs> Nouriel, thank you for joining us today. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, Volker, thanks very much for the kind introduction. It's a great honor and pleasure that Axel is here. We go back a long way when we're both uh, younger academics. I think it was around 1990 something where he, he, he was discussing a paper of mine in Tokyo with some VR models and there was some esoteric discussion about econometric models. <laughs> Since then we've been involved in policy, in markets and lots of other things and so on. And actually uh, this is a relatively younger audience, most of you compared to to me, uh, students, some faculty, other people. Uh, next week, actually, I'm going to turn uh, on March 29, uh, 65 years old. And 65 is the time where the US, you qualify for your pension, social security benefits, and also for Medicare, that is the health care for the elderly people. So I'm becoming officially senior. I qualify for senior discounts. But I say that because. Uh, uh, you know, as uh, Volker was suggesting, I was born in Turkey, moved to Iran, and then Israel, then I grew up in Italy, and I was in Europe growing up until uh, I finished Bocconi, I went to US in 83 for, for grad school, so I spent the first 20 years of my life between Middle East and Europe. But um, some of you were not even born, uh, many of you in the 50s or 60s or 70s, or you were barely born, but um, as a motivation for this new book, Mega Threats, uh, Tenders and Strengths that are impairing our future and how to survive them, I remember that when I was growing up, say, in Italy in the early 1970s, I never really worried about uh, the risk of, say, a nuclear war between uh, great powers. At that time, you know, the US had started a detente with the Soviet Union, there was a rivalry. But after that, the town, the risk of nuclear war between US and Soviet Union went uh, low, not zero, but close to zero. And around the early 70s, uh, Nixon went to China. And again, the risk that there'll be a war between US and China uh, was already low, became uh, insignificant. So certainly, the risk of a nuclear winter was not really even the back of my mind. There are lots of other things we we're worrying about in Europe, but certainly uh, that was not one of them. Well, today, as we know, we are in a geopolitical depression where a number of uh, powers, uh, Russia, China, North Korea, Iran, Pakistan, and others are challenging the economic, social, monetary, political, geopolitical order that the US, Europe, and their allies created after World War II. Uh, there's already a hot war between Russia and Ukraine, a brutal invasion of Ukraine by Russia. Uh, that hot war could get worse this year. Some people even worry about uh, becoming uh, non-conventional, uh, involving nuclear weapons or involving NATO. So that's a very different world, one in which we have to worry about unconventional war among great powers. Uh, when I w was growing up in the early 70s, I really never worried about uh, global climate change. You know, temperatures were barely at that time above pre-industrial levels. There were some concerns about limits of growth, like uh, there was this Club of Rome saying there'll be too many people, not enough water and food for everybody. Well, there was an argument that there was too much people and maybe we did not have enough uh, food and resources for everybody. 
there was not an argument about climate change. People barely started to think about climate change in the early 70s. Um, when I was growing up, I never heard about uh, global pandemics. Maybe I heard about it when in the history books we studied World War I. And of course, after World War I, there was a Spanish flu. Uh, but um, after the Spanish flu, until the early 1980s with uh, HIV and then SARS, uh, nobody even heard about the term global pandemics. Uh, today, instead, uh, we know that could be a serious threat, and we're going to discuss more of it. Um, when I was growing up in the 50s, 60s, and 70s, I never really worried about AI, robotic automation, potentially, eventually destroying most jobs, manual jobs, cognitive jobs, even uh, creative jobs, because at that time we were in the middle of what people refer to as the AI winter. There's lots of theory and research, but pretty much no application. Today, people are concerned about what are going to be implications of AI for jobs, for incomes, for inequality, and you name it. At that time, it really, until at least early 1980s, nobody really worried about uh, debt crisis, private or public, because debt ratios were low. In the 70s, the ratio of private and public debt to GDP in the world was about 100% of GDP. Today is 350 and rising. So debts were low, growth was strong, and therefore debts were sustainable. So systemic uh, debt crises were not uh, on anybody's mind. At that time, nobody really worried about uh, unfunded liability coming from aging. Today, as we know, with aging of population, there are many more uh, older people that are getting benefits that are supposed to be paid, uh, pay as you go, from the payroll taxes of the young. Now there are less young people, more old people, and therefore those implicit liabilities are estimated to be at least 100% of GDP in advanced economies. But in the 60s, there were lots of young people. The elderly were still small, and therefore the concept of unfunded liability or implicit debt was not really on anybody's um, radar screen. Uh, when I was growing up, the risk of uh, great recessions or even the risk of an uh, economic depression was not even in the back of my mind. Yeah, there were business cycles, there were some recessions. They tended to be mild and temporary. Yeah, we had a pretty ugly decade between 1973 and 1982 was the great stagflation of the 70s driven by two negative oil shocks following geopolitical shocks, the Yom Kippur between uh, Israel and the Arab states and the Iranian revolution. But that uh, poor decade of great stagflation was followed by almost three decades of what people refer to as the great moderation, period where inflation was low, averaging closer to 2%, and economic growth was stable. And until the global financial crisis, economic downturns were relatively, relatively mild. So we didn't worry about great recession or another risk of a great uh, depression like we might be today. At that time, uh, the financial cycles were also relatively moderate. You had capital controls, you had financial repression, the financial system was not as big and financialized as today with toxic instruments, derivatives, and you know, and therefore, the kind of financial crisis that we have seen in emerging markets, in advanced economies, the global financial crisis, or the stresses we're seeing even today in some parts of the banking system were the exception uh, rather than the rule. And at that time, politically, if you were lucky enough to live in Europe or in the US or most of the West, uh, those were liberal democracies and were reasonably stable. Uh, yeah, there were center-right parties, center-left parties, uh, but they were relatively different. Uh, differences were relatively mild, I would say, uh, between uh, center-right and center-left, and the kind of very extremist, uh, populist, uh, radical populist party of the extreme right or the extreme left that now you see coming to power, both in advanced economies and emerging markets, uh, were, were the exception rather than the rule. Uh, even within Europe, the countries that had been authoritarian, uh, like Greece, Portugal, Spain, became democratic as they reached middle income. And yet, there were authoritarian countries, it was Soviet Union, it was China, were a poor country, but they were poor countries. In advanced economies, uh, 
you had relatively stable uh, democracies. Now you fast forward to today, and to me, uh, that relatively stable period, not saying that everything was wonderful, there were lots of problems in the world, there was lots of poverty, lots of issues, but I would say the period between 1945 and the early 1980s, mid-80s, was a, a period of relative peace, progress, and stability. In relative terms, think about what had happened before, two world wars, and the kind of disaster and destruction that occurred before, uh, we have lived uh, through relative peace, prosperity, and stability. Now, if I fast forward to the present, I see a series of economic, monetary, and financial risks and threats. And I see a series of non-economic ones that are related to economic, that have been emerging, I would say, in the last 20 or 30 years. Not suddenly, but they are very different from the one that we observed in that more uh, stable period between 1945 and the early 80s. And even the nature of the economic, monetary, and financial risk, I would say today, is very different even compared to what they were, say, or two or three years ago. Uh, I'll give you the following examples. You know, two or three years ago, until 2020, we were worried that inflation was too low, right? Fed, ECB, and other central banks could barely get to 2%. They was worried about uh, lowflation. We even had episodes of deflation. Today, instead, suddenly, in a matter of two years, we're starting to worry about inflation being too high. And last year was almost double digits in advanced economies. And even today is way too high compared to what should be. So threat has gone from deflation to inflation. Two or three years ago, we were worried that uh, we had to worry about secular stagnation. The idea that economic growth was low because there was not enough aggregate demand and there was too much savings in the system and low economic growth was associated also with low inflation and deflation, the idea of secular stagnation. Today we have to worry instead about the risk of stagflation. Stagflation is a situation where you have negative economic growth and high inflation, something we saw in the 70s but were not since then. So we've gone from being concerned about uh, secular stagnation to now being potentially worried about secular stagflation. Um, two or three years ago, we were worried that interest rates were too low. You had zero policy rates, even negative policy rates. Long-term interest rates were low, given quantitative easing and credit easing. And think of it this way. In 2020, there was $18 trillion equivalent of public debt between Europe, the Eurozone, and Japan that had a yield that in, in nominal terms was negative. You remember? <laughs> when Boonza were 50 basis points negative. Um, and same thing was go going on all over the world. Today we have to worry about the opposite, that interest rates are rising, and interest rates rising with levels of private and public debt that are at historical high may lead to a debt crisis. And I would say that the, some of the risks we're seeing right now in the financial system are a manifestation of what happens when you increase interest rates and your stresses of unsustainable liabilities of one sort or another. Boon yields used to be minus 50 basis points that are closer to two and a half, three percentage points higher. Same thing in the US, same thing in the rest of the world. And debt servicing ratios for those that have high debt and leverage, household, corporates, businesses, financial institutions, banks, non-banks, government countries, may lead to severe uh, debt crisis. A uh, few years ago, people were worried that there was too much globalization, even hyper-globalization, while today all the talk is about deglobalization, decoupling, protectionism, fragmentation of the global economy, balkanization. We've gone from one extreme to the other. And two years ago, everybody was worried about this everything bubble, U.S. and global equity were going up as we did the massive easing following the COVID crisis. Private equity was going up. Growth stocks, tech stocks, MIMI stocks, crypto, SPACs, credit, bond yields, lower prices higher. So that everything bubbled. And now we've gone from a period of a everything bubble and a boom and a bubble to a bust and a crash. 
last year, not only equities went down, but also bond is going higher and credit spreads widening, implied that the price of bonds and credit fell. Uh, first time in a long time where both equities and bonds uh, were positively correlated on the way down. So the nature of even the economic, monetary, and financial risk is different today, even compared to, to three years ago. It's a completely different world in terms of the kind of things we have to sort of worry about. Now, in the book, I talk not only about uh, the economic, monetary, and financial threats, the old ones and the new ones, but the series of other threats that are related to the economic ones, but there are, broadly speaking, uh, non-economics. As I pointed out, there is now a risk of certainly cold wars are getting colder among great powers and already hot wars, existing ones like Russia, Ukraine, eventually, potentially, US and China can emerge. As we know, unfortunately, this uh, brutal Russian invasion of Ukraine is continuing. With spring coming, uh, it's going to get uglier. There are states of the world where the Russian could use uh, nuclear weapons to stop the advance of Ukrainian force. The states of the world in which uh, NATO could be involved. Uh, it's a material risk. I don't know whether it's high or low, but it's a material risk. I was just recently in Israel, uh, where Israel has realized now that Iran is effectively a threshold a nuclear state. And Israel will have to make tough decisions this year on whether you deter uh, Iran with traditional MAD, mutual assurance destruction, or whether you're going to strike Iran. If they were to strike Iran as an if, uh, the spike in oil prices could be larger than the one you had in 73 or 1979, where you had in one case the war between Israel and Arab states and the other one, the Islamic revolution in Iran. Um, I'm headed tonight to Beijing, my first trip uh, to Beijing since before COVID. Of course, during COVID there was a uh, quarantine for three weeks, so nobody went there, <laughs> but now they're reopening. Unfortunately, the Cold War between US and China is getting colder by the day and is leading to technological decoupling. There's less cooperation, there is more competition, and there is more confrontation. It's clear that this Cold War is going to get colder, and the only question people ask themselves is whether this Cold War eventually could become a hot war on the issue, for example, of Taiwan. But even if you avoid uh, a hot war, the economic consequences of this Cold War and having a group of countries, Russia, China, Iran, or Korea, Pakistan, and others that are effectively allied, challenging the economic and social and political order that the US, Europe, and the West create after World War II, creates a world of decoupling, of fragmentation of the global economy, of balkanization of global supply chains, of division that could become extreme with economic consequences that are severe because protectionism leads to lower growth and higher cost of production. So there are economic, not just geopolitical consequences, what's happening. Global climate change, as we know, is a severe issue. The damage is huge and is getting worse, literally by the day, if not uh, by the year. You know, last summer, for example, there were massive droughts in Pakistan, in India, in Italy, most of Western Europe, Sub-Saharan Africa, but you have a massive drought in the US from Colorado, California. 80% of Mexico is in a drought. Most of the Latin America or Central America is desertifying. And uh, the economic and social consequences of that uh, are going to become more severe over time unless we address it. And it's not going to be easy to reverse uh, global climate change. On pandemic, I'll make the following observation. Why was it the case that we had pretty much no global pandemic after the Spanish flu until 1980? And since 1980, we've had uh, HIV, SARS, MERS, swine flu, repeated episodes of bird flu, Zika, Ebola, COVID-19. And now scientists are telling us there could be COVID-24 or an episode of birth flu is going to be much more severe than anyone in the past. Uh, these are not natural disasters. These are man-made disasters. Turns out there is a quite strong correlation between uh, climate change and global pandemics. 
because as we destroy the animal ecosystems through urbanization and other things, it turns out that the habitats where animals that carry pathogens, uh, bats, pangolins, and others, shrinking, and those animals get closer and closer over time to either livestock animal or humans. And therefore, these diseases are called uh, zoonotic diseases because they transfer from animal to human. And as we are closer to these, to carry the pathogen, that transmission becomes more likely, more severe, more frequent. And that's why scientists worry that as we destroy the environment and this ecosystem, actually, these things are going to become even worse and more frequent and more dangerous and more violent. So there is a pretty strong connection. Or, say, climate change implies that the permafrost, say, in Siberia, is defrosting. Not only there will be massive amounts of methane frozen that are going to come in the atmosphere, and by the way, methane has mo 10 times more greenhouse gas emissions than, say, CO2, but actually there are pathogens that have been frozen in the tundra for millions of years there or in Greenland and so on. And scientists have discovered some of them have actually back, come back alive. And God knows which kind of freak pathogens or viruses could emerge more virulent than stuff we've seen. They've been frozen there for uh, thousands, if not millions of years. Uh, that's a meaningful risk that actually scientists are talking about. Uh, when we think about AI, machine learning, robotic, and automation, there are, of course, good news. Eventually, productivity growth might be much higher. Potential growth uh, might be also higher. But there are also a number of side effects of these technologies that we have to be concerned about. Number one is that uh, eventually we might have permanent technological unemployment. Initially, routine jobs that are blue collar tend to be automated, but now we've discovered that even cognitive jobs that are white, white collar can be sliced and diced uh, in a series of tasks can be automated, and eventually with generative AI, even creative jo jobs of one sort or another may be subject to automation. Of course, all this is not going to happen overnight. Labor markets in the US and Europe now are tight, but over time, the risk of uh, technological uh, permanent unemployment is a severe one. There's also a risk of increasing income and wealth inequality, because these technological innovation tend to be capital intensive, skill bias, and labor saving. So if you own the machine, you're going to do well. If you own the capital that owns the firms that own the machine, you're going to do well. If you're in the top uh, 10 to 20 percent distribution of skills, human capital, education, like I'm sure everybody in this room, probably AI for a while is going to make you more productive, more efficient, and so on. But if you are a low-value added worker or a middle-value added worker, blue collar or white collar, gradually, it's not going to be again overnight. Your jobs and your income are going to be a threat uh, by, by technology. And that's something that eventually uh, is going to happen, however slowly. And then the, you have to deal with the consequences of it. The final dark side of technologies, unfortunately, is that technological innovations usually are fostered by governments who want to build uh, bigger weapons to fight uh, bigger wars, right? You know, we had the first industrial revolution, where the first era of globalization not only did not prevent World War I, but actually those technological innovations allowed us to build some of the weapons that then were fought in World War I and again in the 30s leading to World War II. Uh, last year was a book that was co-written by Eric Schmidt, former CEO of Google, and Harry Kissinger, who is still at the age of 99, the foremost uh, US uh, geopolitical strategist. And they said, uh, who's going to win uh, the race on AI, whether it's going to be US and the West on one side or China, is not only going to determine who's going to be the leading uh, economic superpower, is going to dominate more of the industries and the firms of the future, but also who's going to be the leading military, geopolitical, and security power, because the nature of warfare, drones, uh, automatic weapon system, eventually robot soldiers, is going to be based also on, on AI. Uh, 
So this is not only about uh, economic security, but it's also about, uh, about, um, about geopolitics. And uh, the final aspect among these mega threats, non-economic, on top of uh, risk of war between great powers, climate change, pandemics, and the risk of AI and automation, is there is today, unfortunately, some backlash against liberal democracy. And extremist uh, populist party of the extreme right and left uh, are coming into power, both in advanced economies and emerging markets. Some of it is driven by rising income and wealth inequality. Some of it is driven by economic malaise. Some of it is driven by young generation feeling they're going to be worse off than their own parents and so on. And there's some of it also social, religious, cultural factors, but they're fed by economic insecurity. And I could give you a dozen of examples of how we're moving in that direction. Uh, Martin Wolf, economic commentator of the FT, has written just a great book recently about uh, uh, the crisis of democratic capitalism and what we can do about it. Paul Tucker, former deputy of the Bank of England, has written another book about how we can create a new economic, social, and geopolitical order uh, to avoid having uh, drifting towards authoritarianism. But the manifestation of it is, is ugly, even within Europe and other parts of the world of that authoritarianism. In the US was uh, the Trump phenomenon. In the UK was the Brexit, just to give you some of the examples. And of course, you have Putin in Russia, you have Erdogan in Turkey, you have Orban in, uh, in Hungary, and lots of other examples of authoritarians around the world. And the biggest one of all is Xi Jinping. I don't know whether authoritarian of the right or the left, but definitely uh, China has become much more authoritarian other, uh, under Xi Jinping. <coughs> now, I call all these uh, economic, monetary, and financial, and non-economic uh, uh, threats, mega threats, I talk about 10 of them, and it's like a matrix of 10 by 10 in which each one of them affects the other and vice versa. So it's a system. You cannot just study them in isolation. I've used that term, but uh, the Financial Times just at the end of last year chose as one of the words of the year the term uh, polycrisis. And polycrisis is a term that Adam Tooze and a bunch of other economists have uh, coniated to express that we live in a world in which there is a connection between economic, monetary, and financial, and non-economic threats feeding on each other. Uh, I presented my book last December at the IMF and had a, a very nice conversation and debate in public with Kristalina Georgieva, uh, the managing director of the IMF. She gave a speech in which she spoke about what she calls a, a confluence of calamities, like we have not seen since World War II. And in January, I was uh, in Davos for the World Economic Forum. That week, the WEF uh, published their annual global risk report, and it was all about economic and non-economic threats and polycrisis. So I don't, I don't mind whether you call it mega threats, or whether you call it polycrisis, or you call it a confluence of calamities, or as the WEF said, we're going to face the most unstable and turbulent uh, how to say, decade ahead since uh, World War II. Those are just uh, various terms that talk about the same phenomenon. I think that there is a consensus that these are serious threats that we have to worry about. You know, in the book, I don't talk about asteroids hitting planet Earth or aliens coming and take over planet Earth. They may or may not happen. We have no control on those things, but we have a control, of course, on what happens to our economic, social, political, technological, environmental, health, and other types of threats, and what we can do you know, about, uh, about addressing them. Um, if I had to just uh, develop some of the, some of the ideas, um, I think that one of the important points that I stress in the book is that that period uh, that was called of the Great Moderation, a uh, period uh, since the early late 80s and early 90s, where inflation was low, economic growth relatively stable, uh, that period might be over. And we might be entering this new era that I call of, of great uh, stagflationary and debt instability. 
And usually people, when they think about what led to inflation to be low, around 2% for three decades, they tell a story that is based on uh, central banks after the 70s moving to inflation targeting. Say, because we committed to 2% inflation, we got 2% inflation. I think that interpretation is naive. It's naive because uh, uh, there were a series of uh, positive aggregate supply shocks that lasted for the last few decades that kept inflation low and growth relatively high and stable where trade and globalization, even hyper-globalization, with massive technological innovations. We had uh, migration from south to north, from poor to rich countries uh, to Europe and US that kept a lead on wage growth. We had a weakening, uh, rightly or wrongly, of the power of workers and unions, especially in the US, but also partially you know, in, uh, in Europe, the reforms that Schroeder did in Germany made the labor market uh, more flexible. We had this uh, neoliberal economic policy that stressed competition, the regulation, that also led to maybe lower, uh, lower prices. So there was a whole series of things. And of course, we had the geopolitical dividend of the collapse of the Soviet Union, of China joining the global labor supply, and whether it was Soviet Union, or Central Eastern Europe, or China, or India, or other emerging markets. They all joined the global labor supply. They joined the global labor market. So China provided us with cheap goods. Uh, India provided us with cheap high-tech services. And Russia and a whole bunch of other countries provided us with cheap commodities. And that was also part of the great moderation. So I think those positive supply shocks were much more important than inflation targeting to explain why we had uh, the great moderation. Now, inflation in the last uh, couple of years has spiked. And of course, there's been an economic debate on whether the spike in inflation was due to bad policies or bad luck. Bad policy being excessively loose monetary, fiscal, and credit easing following COVID, too much for too long, those three factors, as opposed to bad luck being a series of uh, uh, persistent negative aggregate supply shocks. And the three of them were the impact of COVID initially on production of goods and services, on the supply of labor, and on global supply chains. Secondly, the impact of the brutal Russian invasion of Ukraine on energy prices, food, fertilizers, and industrial metals. And three, until recently, the zero COVID policy of China also created bottlenecks in domestic production and global supply chains. There's been a heated debate how much was bad policy, bad luck, probably a combination of both. Uh, more bad luck in Europe given exposure to energy in Russia, more excessive stimulus uh, in the US but also in Europe. But the point I want to make is the following one. Even if some of those negative supply shocks were to fade out, let's suppose we're lucky, and Russia-Ukraine war is going to be over. Unlikely. Let's assume so. Let's assume there's not going to be another major COVID episodes. And let's assume that China happily uh, phase out zero COVID policy and the return to growth and all the rest, and those supply bottlenecks disappear. Uh, in the book, I identify at least 10 medium to long-term negative aggregate supply shocks that increase uh, the cost of production, reduce potential growth, so there's stagflation in nature, and if then you have loose monetary and fiscal policy, and I'll argue why monetary fiscal policy is going to be loose, then eventually you're going to end up with inflation, with stagflation, and with that problems that are going to become unsustainable. So that's why I say the great moderation is over, and the great uh, stagflation and that instability that are upon us. Now, I don't have time to go in each one of these 10. I'll be very brief. But each one of them think of it as being a negative supply shock. Growth is lower, cost of production is higher. One, deglobalization and protectionism. We used to talk about free trade, now fair trade, and now secure trade, right? Uh, we have now moving from offshoring to reshoring or friendshoring, rather than just in time, a global supply chains, redundant and more costly, just in case. Uh, supply chain, that's costly. Uh, 
We have aging of population, not just the US, Europe, Japan, and advanced economies, but also in significant emerging markets like China, Russia, South Korea, Taiwan, among others. Young people produce, they save more than they consume. Old people overall retire, they don't produce, and they spend and they save. Everything else equal that uh, inflationary and stagflationary. In the past, we had migration from south to north, keeping a lead on wage growth in spite of aging. But now, Europe, US, advanced economies are restricting migration for a whole bunch of reasons. I would say the policies of the Biden administration towards migrants are almost no different from those of Trump. There's a swell of people trying to come from uh, Latin America, Central America, economic failure, political failure, climate change. They're sad, they're desperate, they want a whole better life. And even Biden says, sorry, sorry, you cannot get in. And it's going to get worse as climate change is going to lead to hundreds of millions of climate refugees, not just a few millions and so on. We have this geopolitical depression and it's leading to decoupling. As I said, it's going to get worse. Uh, more decoupling, more fragmentation, more protectionism, more balkanization and so on. We have the impact of global climate change is stagflationary in two dimensions. Dimension number one, we rightly bashing fossil fuel producers and telling them produce less and invest less into capacity. Shareholders, stakeholders, financial institutions, everybody's telling them big oil, don't invest in new capacity. And for the last decade, they've been reducing investment new capacity. So there's been a significant fall in the capacity of production of new fossil fuels. We have boosted green energy but the rise in green energy production, however strong, has not been sufficient to compensate for the fall of fossil fuels. So there's a structural lack of supply of energy. Even before the Russian invasion of Ukraine, Brent was $100 per barrel. And of course, spiked even more. The fact that it's fallen recently is because there is worries about the global recession. So it's a demand issue. On the supply side, there's a bottleneck. Second implication of global climate change, you have desertification, lack of water, droughts, and uh, that reduces the arable land and it spikes food prices. Again, even before the Russian invasion of Ukraine, food prices globally were high and rising, and climate change is going to make it worse. So climate change has these effects that are stagflationary. Of course, as I said, COVID was a negative supply shock, and if we're going to have more pandemics, more of the same. Increasingly, we're going to have also cyber warfare. Whenever there is a cyber attack that damages production, uh, either you shut down economic activity in some firm or sector, or if you have to protect yourself, you have to spend a fortune more. That's stagflationary. And two final factors. Because there has been such a rise against the uh, rise of income and wealth inequality, there is social strife. People are restless. There's more uh, social strife, there is more labor strife, and fiscal policies are increasingly becoming, rightly so, because otherwise we'll have social turmoil, pro-labor, pro-union, pro-workers, pro-unemployed, pro-partial employed, pro-minorities, pro pro-people pro left behind. And we have to do it because if we don't do it, eventually there'll be social strife, but that increases reservation wage, increased wage growth, everything else equal. Final point. Because of national security reasons, we are weaponizing the dollar, but in the case of Russia, even the euro, yen, the pound, as a way of punishing and deterring the rivals, that weaponization of the dollar may lead, one, to gradual de-dollarization and a weakening of the dollar, but with inflation, and more, more importantly, in the global international payment system, you need a reserve currency that greases international payments. If you essentially create and weaponize uh, reserve currency, it's like throwing sand in the wheels in that system of payments. And those kind of frictions increase the cost of international payments of goods, of services, of the movement of labor, capital, technology, data information. So they're stagflationary. So these are 10 factors on the supply side to different degrees, but they are all essentially going to lead to lower growth and higher cost of production. What's happening on the demand side? Well, central banks are telling us 
We're going to fight inflation at any cost. We're committed to it. I do believe that they want to bring inflation to 2%, but I think there are uh, several concerns on why they're not going to be able to do so. First of all, economists think, uh, usually talk about, uh, those of you who are familiar, of two concepts, uh, fiscal versus monetary dominance. And the argument is, suppose your fiscal authority is running a large fiscal deficit and debt, then who's going to blink? Uh, one view is there is a fiscal dominance and the monetary authority is going to have to monetize those deficits, because otherwise you have crowding out or debt crisis, or there's mon or monetary dominance. By credibly committing to low inflation, you're going to force the fiscal authority to blink. Uh, increasingly, I think there is a risk of fiscal dominance, but that was a story about public debt. The reality is today we have not just a lot of public debt, but we have also lots of private debt. And therefore, we are in what the economists at the BIS, the Bank for International Settlement, call a debt trap. There is so much private and public debt in the system that if central banks were to raise inflation, interest rates enough to fight inflation, not only you get a hard landing of the real economy, but debt servicing ratio that were low now are going to become much higher, and those highly leveraged households, businesses, corporates, banks, shadow banks, government countries may default, and you'll have a tightening of financial condition. It's going to make the recession worse, and a worse recession is going to make defaults more likely. And faced with an economic and financial crash, central banks will have to blink. They're going to wimp out because they have to monetize these deficits. Because if you have a bout of unexpected inflation, the real value of nominal long-duration debt is going to be reduced by unexpected inflation. So the path of least resistance politically in a debt trap is going to be to monetize those deficits. Related argument, economic historians like uh, Neil Ferguson have recently written an uh, entire paper showing that whenever there are big wars, uh, you have bigger budget deficits, you spend more on war, and therefore debt is rising, and uh, by default uh, you tend to monetize it, and therefore you get inflation. So wars, deficit, monetization, inflation, it happens regularly. Today, my view is that we're going to have to fight uh, not one war, but five types of wars. The first one is, of course, that we have cold wars or hot wars that requires that we spend more on defense. Europe will spend more on defense. Germany, US, China, India, Japan, Israel, the Middle East, everyone around the world, given the geopolitical depression, cold wars or hot wars or a combination of the two, defense spending is going to be higher. That's, that's the given. Two, we have to fight a war against global climate change, and whether you want to do mitigation or adaptation, it's going to cost us trillions of dollars, mostly on the public purse. Three, we're going to have other global pandemics. So either we spend a fortune to prevent the next one, or if we do like COVID and we don't prevent it, as we know, the fiscal costs were huge, trillions of dollars of deficits. Four, the combination of still persistent globalization and this uh, robotic automation revolution, what people refer to as being the globotic revolution, is going to imply massive amounts of permanent technological unemployment. We'll have to have a bigger social safety net for those who are going to be left behind, right? Or to protect them against those kind of shocks. Otherwise, people are going to push back against the flexible labor market. And finally, there is such a rise in income and wealth inequality that we'll have to spend more to essentially reduce that inequality exposed by, by transferring money to those who are left behind. So there are five types of war we have to fight. All of them imply that government spending as a share of GDP is going to be higher. Revenues as a share of GDP in Europe, but even the US, are already very high. There may be some room to increase them, but unlikely we'll be able to increase taxes as much as spending, because one, they're too high, to that all the political constraints of raising taxes more. So you get structurally higher budget deficits. And what happens then? Either you crowd out growth and or you have unsustainable debts and debt crisis. The kind of debt crisis occurred in emerging markets because of excessive debt can occur even in advanced economies. Look what happened to Greece. Look what would happen to Italy. Look what happened potentially to UK. Eventually even US could have a fiscal crisis. So 
if we have structural hardware deficits and either they crowd out growth or they cause unsustainable debt crisis, in advanced economies at least we have the advantage of being able to wipe out the real value of nominal debt with unexpected inflation and therefore the path of least resistance is going to be to monetize them. And the political pressure on central banks to monetize them and cause some inflation is going to become, in my view, irresistible. I don't think the central banks are evil or stupid. I know all of them, very intelligent, sophisticated people. The question is constraint. You have a f version of both fiscal dominance and financial dominance. There is so much private and public debt that we're not going to get monetary dominance. We're going to have the combination of fiscal and uh, of financial dominance. And we've seen examples of them recently. And it's going to get only worse. So you end up with, uh, with inflation. And by the way, I'm not in the camp of those that some people say hyperinflation, thousands percent, like Weimar or Argentina, or high inflation like Turkey today, 100% Argentina, or double digit inflation, uh, 10, 12%, 15, like the 70s. My expectation actually is that the average inflation rate, uh, say in advanced economies, instead of being two, is going to be six, right? Not something crazy. I'm not talking about something like high or hyper. And people say, what's the difference between two and six? Big deal, right? It's a huge difference. And I'll give you the following example. Suppose the average inflation rate in advanced economy were to be six, because we have to use some inflation to monetize these deficits. Uh, what's going to happen to long-term interest rates? Uh, Ten-year treasuries or boons will have to be uh, a yield of about 8%, 6% for inflation and 2% real. Why 2% real? When inflation is high and volatile, the inflation risk premium becomes positive and higher because you have to protect yourself against the risk that unexpected inflation is going to wipe out the real value of your debt. So 2% real is actually reasonable. It's 8%. Uh, last year, U.S. 10-year Treasury yields went from 1 to 3.5, and, and boons went from minus 50 to 2.5, about uh, 250 basis points to 300 basis points increases. Last year, the yield went higher in U.S., the price fell, bond prices fell in U.S. by 20%, S&P fell only by 15%. So safe bonds that should be giving you protection in bad times actually lost more money than equities. The correlation between bonds and equities that usually is negative, risk on, risk off, growth, recession. So if you lose money in equity, you make money on bonds and vice versa, broke down. You lost money on equities, you lost money on bonds. This is yields going from one to three and a half. Suppose 10 year treasury have to go over time from three and a half to eight and boon yields from two and a half to eight. You have another losses of 50 or 60% on about $40 trillion of long duration fixed income in Euro or Yen or dollar around the world. 60% be disaster, let alone the impacts uh, on equity prices because the, the discount rate for equity is going to go much higher and you're going to end up like the 70s when P ratios for S&P 500 firms was 7 in 1982. Today is about 18. So even moderate inflation will have massive consequences. But the problem is that central banks are damn if you do and damn if you don't. If they fight inflation, there could be an economic and financial crash, and they may not allow it. And if they don't fight inflation, they bleed out. Inflation expectation gets the anchored. Wage price part becomes more severe. It happens like the 70s. We're behind the curve. And those of us who are old enough or young enough, like Axel and I, to remember the 70s, we knew how ugly it was even double-digit inflation in the 70s and the consequences of stagflation. And right now, we're in this trap. Central banks have not just a dilemma. If you fight inflation, you cause a hard landing. They have a trilemma. If you fight inflation, you cause a hard landing and financial distress and instability. Achieving two goals is hard enough. Achieving three of them is mission impossible. So you end up with inflation, stagflation, and that uh, becoming unsustainable. And why they become unsustainable if you're using inflation? Five, six percent inflation is not enough to wipe up the real value of the debt. And once it's expected, all short and long rates get repriced. Real rates go higher, so you can postpone by a couple of years a debt crisis. But then with real rates rising, the debt crisis occurs anyhow. So, so eventually, you can save yourself a couple of years
of reducing debt, but you need high inflation, unexpected, if not hyper, to wipe up debt. And that's not going to happen. So we're going to still have, have a debt crisis. I'll make some final observations. In the 1970s, uh, we had stagflation because of negative supply shocks, but debt ratios in advanced economies were very low, 100% of GDP. So we didn't have a debt crisis in the US and Europe. We had a debt crisis in Latin America because they borrowed like crazy in the 70s. And then when Volcker spiked uh, policy rates to 20%, of course, Argentina, Brazil, Mexico, they went bankrupt. But US and Europe, you didn't have a debt crisis. After the GFC, the global financial crisis, we had a debt crisis, too much household debt, housing debt, mortgages, and bank debt. So we had a debt crisis. But the shock was a demand shock, a credit crunch. And following that shock, we had deflation. So we could do massive monitoring, fiscal and credit easing, and avoid the Great Recession from becoming a Great Depression. Today, instead, we have the worst of the 70s in this terms of a series of negative supply shocks. And as I said, over the medium term, there are 10, you have to worry about them. But you have today debt ratios that are actually an order of magnitude even higher than the onset of the global financial crisis. So we have the worst of the 70s and the worst of the post-GFC. And on top of it, we have this uh, geopolitical depression. As I pointed out, the first industrial revolution, the first era of globalization did not prevent uh, World War I. And after World War I, we had what? Spanish flu, the stock market crash of 29, the beginning of the Great Depression, trade wars, currency wars. Initially, we got uh, deflation, then we got inflation, back to deflation. We had uh, massive defaults across the boards in advanced economies. Uh, we had uh, financial meltdowns, we had unemployment rate at 20%. And then, unfortunately, the Nazis came power in Germany, the fascists in Italy, Franco in Spain, those militaries in Japan. We ended up in World War II. We ended up uh, with the Holocaust. So we had 30 years, that was a total nightmare. But how, however bad those 30 years were, in the 30s, we didn't have to worry about global climate change, right? Didn't exist. That's a major existential threat. In the 30s, uh, we didn't have to worry about AI destroying most jobs. There was not even computers, let alone AI. That was not even on the radar screen. Uh, in the 30s, we didn't have to worry about implicit liability coming from aging of population. Uh, Social Security in the US had been just created in the 30s, and the average worker, he or she would die at the age of 60 before he or she would get even the first social security check at 62. So there was no unfunded, actually it was a scheme, was making money for the government. And as ugly as World War I and World War II were, they were mostly conventional wars. And luckily it was the US who got the bomb at the end of World War II, the nuclear bomb, and unfortunately had to use it in Hiroshima and Nagasaki to stop World War II. Uh, rather than Japanese getting it, uh, but was effectively a conventional war. If today, and it's a if, a conventional war were to occur between major powers and all of them have the bombs, US advanced economies, but among the rivals, China, Russia, North Korea, Pakistan, and Iran is effectively a threshold nuclear state, any conventional conflict between great powers or even not great powers is going to easily from conventional become unconventional, and the threat of a nuclear winter will be upon us. I hope it doesn't happen. Hopefully, it's not going to happen. But in four dimensions, climate change, AI, and liabilities, the risk of a nuclear winter, things are actually more dangerous today than those ugly 30 years and were the ugliest ones. We had then, since then, 75 years of relative peace and prosperity and progress. And we tend to project the future as if it's going to be close to the recent past. But if you look at the human history for thousands of years, we had war, famine, genocide, violence, and you name it, and diseases. It was only since the Industrial Revolution and after two world wars that we've had now 75 years of relative peace and prosperity and progress. We hope that we're going to continue it, but I honestly think we cannot take it for granted.
either we recognize that there are these mega threats, these poly crises, these conflicts and calamities, and we start individually, collectively, nationally, internationally to address them, or otherwise the idea that the future is going to be like recent past may turn out not to be right, and therefore my book is a bit a wake-up call to be aware of the threats of our face and do something about it, and hopefully the West and even those who are not in the West can at least cooperate because these are existential threats to not only our economic, finance, jobs, savings, and wealth, but also existential threats to our own species and to our planet. So we have to do something about it because it comes too late. Okay, I'll, I'll stop here. <laughs> not cheerful, but <laughs> thanks. <laughs> Remember, you critiqued a, a paper of mine. <laughs> I don't know if you want to critique the entire book. No, now no, no. I, I've written four pages, and I ran out of. I usually have one page with me, so <laughs> I ran out of. Uh, I ran out of space. Uh, I'm not really sure I feel better uh, than cr <laughs> criticizing a paper of yours about vector order regressions. But uh, you know, my my first question would be: When you write part two, uh -huh. the solutions. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Because. <laughs> I mean, you're absolutely right, and I think most people in the room think it's, it's, an, it's a good description of where yeah. we are. There are many, many problems, uh, and I think your appeal in the end, somebody do something about it, is right, yeah. but who should do what? Yeah. That's yeah. more the question that I think you need to ask. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I've, I've been in, in, in my professional life, having been 20 years an academic, I turned to then being 20 years a manager of things, uh, you know, first the Bundesbank, then a large bank which just did a major takeover of the other bank in Switzerland and actually one of the things that you could say is had we not worked 10 years to make that bank the strongest bank in Europe it would have not been able to help the government solve the problem so my question to you would be as somebody who likes understanding problems but <coughs> also likes to fix problems and work on solutions what would be when you have a 10 by 10 matrix it's a daunting task what would be your number, because I, I think yeah. people never get, can count more than three, what would be your three recommendations to a policymaker instead of your hundred uh, for the hundred matrix, what would be your three recommendations yeah. to a policymaker what to do, and first, who would be the one or two top institutions that you think should do it? Um, very valid uh, sets of questions. Well, in, in the book for each one of these mega threats in each chapter, as I talk about the threats, and the uh, potential policy solutions. Uh, we're economists, and we believe uh, as economists that there is no free lunch, uh, that any solution implies uh, some short-term cost and sacrifices for the common good over the medium long term. But there are solutions to each one of these problems, but each one of them has some pros and cons. The question is uh, one political willingness domestically to do the right thing. You know, my favorite example is Gerhard Schroeder, we did the reforms that led to German industry becoming more competitive labor market. Then he went to the lecture too soon and he lost them. And the lesson was uh, <laughs> their cost. And whether you're in a democracy or even an authoritarian regime, um, the view is you know the costs are in the short run, might not be in power in the medium long term. Are you have institutional willing if to do the right If I can just jump in yeah, here, uh, because yeah. you know absolutely right. I was on the German Council of Economic Advisors. Volker was on it at some point. And we were, at that time, with Bad Rurup and others, drafting uh, 10 things to do for the government, so yeah. again 10, 10 things to do for the government to move to growth and prosperity in Germany. Social reform was one of them. And whenever I talked to Schroeder after, uh, I moved to the Bundesbank in 2004, but whenever I talked to Schroeder in 2005 and any time after that, he told me, you guys lost me the election because your recommendations for what I needed to do might have helped my successor for 10, 15 years in office, but they actually produced a lot of pushback for me in government. So mm -hmm. the question you have, if you make those suggestions, does that example, which is your prime example, yeah. is that not a counter example of why if you do the right thing at the right time, it still politically is not viable because it had negative political consequences? Yeah, no, that, 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 that's a constraint. Uh, we need to have uh, leadership that is willing to do the right thing, and depending on the country, that may or may not be feasible. 
I'll give you another example. I mean, on climate change, of course, we can do lots of things on mitigation and on adaptation. Why we're not doing it or doing it too slowly? Uh, there are several constraints. And rather than doing a wishing list, wishful thinking list of if we already did all these things, we we'll resolve this problem, we have to understand what are the constraints, how we can deal with them. Constraint number one, in many countries, starting with the US where I live, half of the people don't believe in human-driven climate change. When Republicans are in power and maybe in power again, things are reversed. Number two, there is an intergenerational conflict. You know, I'm 65, I'll be lucky if I live another 30 years. I care about the environment, but if you're young, you're gonna have a life expectancy of 100. Unfortunately, the young don't vote, the elderly vote. And even the young, are you willing to make the sacrifice to reduce your own individual carbon footprint? Everybody should be becoming vegan. Everybody should be using reusable bags. Everybody should insulate their homes and have a solar panel. It's costly. So even the young don't do it, let alone the elderly. Three, there is a, what's called the free rider problem. Suppose a country does all the effort to reduce their emission to zero, but nobody else does it. Emissions are global. You don't get any benefits. You, call, you have the cost, how you coordinate 100 countries or 200 to do the right thing. Four, there's a conflict between rich and poor countries. We're telling India and China, cut your emission to zero in the next 20 years the way we want to do in Europe and US. They say, you create this problem. You had 200 years of industrialization. 90% of the inter historical stock of emission is the West. I'm poor, I'm trying to get middle class, middle income. I'm gonna emit for another 20 years once I'm richer. I'm gonna do it unless you give me massive transfers in trillions of dollars. That's not gonna happen. And uh, finally, in a world where there is a geopolitical competition between US and China, we don't agree on free trade, we don't agree on investment, we don't agree on economic financial stability, we don't agree on how to deal with pandemics, we don't agree on global security. It's very hard to agree on climate change. So these are five or six factors that constrain doing the right thing. So I'm all in favor of doing the right thing, but we should be aware what are the constraints, the bottleneck, national, international, and then how we address them individually to resolve them. Just saying we should do the right thing is, is just uh, talking about what's normative as opposed to what is likely to happen. So we have to make sure that what is likely to happen moves towards what is desirable to happen. Those are some of the constraints. So I'm just going to buy the audience 10 more seconds to think about the first questions from the floor because Nouria yeah. uh, agreed yeah. to also answer questions from the floor. Just to follow up on just what you said, yeah. uh, having sat on the G20 and the G7 ministers yeah. and governors meeting myself for a couple of years, that international architecture we had on solving problems globally, global commons is one uh, thing, yeah. the new uh, global south is another, yeah. That architecture has broken down because now there is parties that are at war sitting around the same table and if they, uh, how can they solve these big problems if, and do we need a new architecture, which is a big discussion at the next IMF meeting, do we need a new architecture for solving these global problems because the architecture we have kind of seems to have gone more dysfunctional than it was in any time in the last 30, 40 years? Uh, yeah, in principle, we need a new architecture it's hard enough to resolve some of these problems domestically because there are all these political constraints domestically on short-term cost and benefits over the medium term, long term. In a world in which there is more, uh, how to say, divisions between great powers, uh, it's even harder to that global cooperation coordination. There's a view in international relations that when you have a global hegemon, that global hegemon could have been the British Empire in the 19th century, the American Pax Americana in this one, you internalize those global externalities and you're willing to provide global public goods, security, free trade, capital mobility, and you name it. In a world in which now you have all these other powers, US, Europe, China, India, and others, it's much harder to provide global public goods. We have to try harder. Unfortunately, between US and China, there's a combination of cooperation, competition, and confrontation. And the stuff that is corporate is becoming less the stuff is competition or confrontation is becoming more. So it's not just a question of designing new, how to say, system of global governance, is whether those are viable or not viable. I think that's the challenge. Of course, many of these problems are global in nature, security, climate change, pandemic, economic and financial stability, even the impacts of AI, and the solution have to be global. The question is how we create an architecture that allows to have more cooperation rather than less cooperation. Maybe it can be done, but it's not easy. 
It's not easy, obviously. Okay, so we open up. There's a gentleman in the back with a red microphone. Uh, when you have a question, raise your hand. Uh, we'll, uh, is Volker here? Uh, but I can give you mine. Sorry, you don't have to walk. We'll save energy. Um, and um, please mention your name. Volker, of course, is known. But anybody that asks a question, mention your name before you ask the question. Yeah. Um, maybe to start with one uh, problem which we have very close to home now and which seems like uh, one has to resolve fairly soon to be able to address more effectively the other ones is the Russian invasion of Ukraine. You mentioned that. I mean, a number of dimensions, of course, the risk that there might be uh, a nuclear element. But, you know, it seems, you know, if you think of climate change, we need to be able to bind in somehow one of the biggest suppliers of fossil fuel. So uh, how do you see um, the war panning out? What do you, and not in terms of prediction, but what do you think is now the best strategy for the West to uh, um, come to a, a good end or to an end sooner than later, which is actually sustaining a, a positive development into the future? Um, what could be done? Yeah. Uh, we have a big movement in Germany who basically says, well, you need to negotiate, negotiate, negotiate. Yeah. We just yeah. had demonstrations about that. Uh, what do you think? Um, unfortunately, I think that the next few months the war is going to get uglier. Winter is over. Both sides are going to uh, try to make inroads and get uh, territory. Um, I think, don't think that eventually uh, Ukraine is going to get back Crimea or even most of those uh, four provinces if they were able to go to, say, the borders of February 24 of last year, that will be already a success. If that would happen, I think that then you can go to the Russian and say, okay, let's have a ceasefire, figure out uh, something, and eventually, unfortunately, a piece of uh, Ukraine is going to remain under Russian control. That's the bad news. The good news is that uh, there will be a part that leads to eventually Ukraine becoming effectively part of the EU. And while Ukraine is not going to be a formal member of NATO, that would not be a good idea. Effectively, this war implies there'll be both weapons and security guarantees from NATO and the West that are going to imply that Ukraine is going to be firmly in the Western camp. So the best we can hope is you have six months of ugly war, the Ukrainians make inroads, and at that point, the Russians accept that they have to compromise on something. Whether that's going to happen or not, I have no idea, but that'll be probably the best scenario. Questions further? There's two. Maybe we start with the gentleman there, and then we move to the gentleman here. Yeah. Yeah, Dietmar Berker is my name. Uh, don't you think that if there is a threat or if there is a problem, there's also a solution? For example, I was, uh, was very much impressed how quick the Fed responded to the problem with the two U.S. banks. They immediately, over a weekend, managed uh, to start two new programs which they had never had before, and the thing was done. In Switzerland, they had the problem with this, uh, well, bad bank, and within a week, yeah, they managed to solve the problem. The uh, the, this, uh, the, uh, by that, yeah. they created a new problem uh, for the COCO or Tier 1 capital, mm -hmm. and immediately the European authorities or whoever that was reacted to it and solved the problem. So why do you want to increase the German angst? Or, <laughs> I mean, I understand the, uh, uh, I have read the book uh, in yeah. the 70s about these big problems which arise, but we don't know the solution yet, but there are ways of solutions. Yeah. So, yeah. please um, come to the point where the solutions are to the solution yeah. side, or is it just yeah. the, uh, to yeah. increase the German angst? Well, no, as I said, uh, in each chapter I talk about the solution. And the answer is there is no free lunch. All of them require sacrifices for the common good over the medium term. And I hope we'll have the political fortitude nationally and globally to do the right thing. Uh, there are two end and chapter one about a utopian future where gradually good policies and technologies, some luck, lead us to a more utopian future where things don't collapse. And there's a dystopian one where everything can feed on each other and it's the end of not the economy but also the world.
Uh, the history is never deterministic, depends on good policy, leadership, people individually, collectively, nationally and globally doing the right thing. What I, I think of the book as being a call to arms, uh, saying let's wake up, let's not live like zombies, let's not pretend these things don't exist. As I said, I'm not talking about Martians invading uh, the planet or asteroids hitting us. These are mega threats that I address, but whether it's the web, whether it's the IMF, whether it's polycrisis, whether it's confluence of calamities, I think there's a consensus that these are serious threats we have to address. We can address them, but it's not gonna be easy. And at this point, we cannot waste time. It's a really a, a, a kind of a wake up call to say, let's, uh, let's do something about it. And that's the way I think of the book. And, and I talk about each one of the solution for each one of these problems, pointing out that there is no miracle bullet, there is no free lunch. But we have to do it because otherwise our future is at risk. So I agree on doing the right thing. Okay, my name is um, Ulrich Schielein. <coughs> I'm one of the vice presidents here of uh, Goethe University. I have a question for you uh, concerning um, the idea of our German government to build what they call a 100 billion Sondervermögen. Yeah, so if they issue zero coupon bonds for 100 years, um, inflation of 6 to 8 percent is uh, eliminating the, the debts. On the other side, uh, they are buying or creating uh, military equipment, which is creating an intouchable product called safety, which is not polluting the environment, but it's creating a lot of uh, GDP and, and employment. So what do you think about it? Uh, could it be the uh, perpetuum mobile to create uh, growth uh, without polluting the environment? <laughs> Um, I, I think that uh, both Germany and Europe is doing the right thing of spending somehow more on defense. Uh, there are security threats. Uh, the US is going to be there, NATO is going to be there, but I think that the Europeans having, I don't think the Europeans are going to get full what they call strategic autonomy. That would imply spending on defense amounts that are not viable. Uh, you'll have also to make sure there is no duplication, but I think that more European defense spending together with commitment of US to NATO and so on is going to be important to make sure that we have security in Europe but also in Asia. How you got about financing it? In principle, if you have investment in public goods, whether it's the green transition or security, you want to spread the cost over time and therefore financing uh, public infrastructures or public uh, goods and defense and energy and green transitions are public goods financing them with debt over time is the right solution. Um, whether you finance it with long-term bonds as opposed to other ones and so on, those are financial engineering details that can be, be addressed. But it's important that you know, Europeans are working on uh, security, they're working on the green transition, are working on the digital transition. All these things are investment that address some of the mega threats that I'm talking about in the book. So as long as they're done, we're going in the right direction. I think we have one more question. Uh, I'm not sure, Volker, how long uh, yeah. you were planning for. You have to, he has to go to the yeah. airport. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Okay. yeah, I'm flying to China, yeah. so Th there was maybe a last question. Sure. All right, Th thank you very much. I'm uh, Ine Barruga from the European Central Bank. Um, I have perceived through your intervention today, more than yesterday, if I, because I also yeah. listened to you yesterday, that uh, climate change, like, is probably in your mind the biggest of all mm -hmm. events playing or threats playing into, yeah. into your thinking. And then there is another one which is I mean, there's a less important question, but uh, today I had the impression that uh, all this expenditure which was necessary to, to maintain our societies, which is what has happened during the, the, the pandemic, we have kept our societies alive as they were yeah. before the yeah. pandemic. Yeah. That you see them as provoking, causing a inflation, but all, all, these, all these activities that you have been describing throughout your presentation and your book, yeah. they, are, they are also growth creating. They also create growth. The, great, the green transition, you say, is inflationary, stagflationary, but it's also a lot of European growth which is inside of it. Mm -hmm. right? And yeah. that's why Europe wants to be a, the, the leader in green, because it's like a way of ensuring itself, like a privileged position from an economic point of view as well. Yeah, thank um, you. I would agree with you that some of these things have a 
global public good component to them, whether it's security, climate change, uh, pandemic, dealing with the economic consequence of automation, of inequality. Uh, but we cannot consider everything as something that is a kind of a investment spending and finance it with debt. Debt ratios are way too high. And we have to recognize that if we're going to have to spend more as a share of GDP on things that are important for us, one, there is some fat we can cut. And for every country, there are forms of spending that are not productive. That will be the first best. Or if we don't do that, issuing too much debt eventually could become unsustainable could crowd out economic growth or could be eventually uh, monetized. And therefore, uh, and on, 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 the, on the growth implication of some of these things, I would say it's a little bit complicated because uh, think about climate change. Of course, we have to invest a lot to stop it because otherwise the growth damage is going to be severe. But it's like saying that uh, suppose there is a war and the war destroys your capital stock or you have a negative supply shock like an oil shock and a lot of your capital stock becomes obsolete. You can do a lot of investment and there'll be higher growth, but you have destroyed essentially part of your capital stock. And climate change implies that some of our capital stock, the stuff that is not energy efficient, all the real estate that's gonna be stranded, is a huge loss of wealth. And even if there'll be more growth, that loss of wealth is a loss that given the mistakes of the past, is going to have to be accepted. So we are poorer, even if we're going to have higher economic growth. Hopefully, if we do the right thing, some of these things take us to real growth. But the idea we can finance all of this with debt and not worry about debt ratio already too high, I think that will be a bit naive. Unfortunately, we have to make tough choices. I would rather have cuts of unproductive spending rather than raising taxes that are already high and distortionary. Uh, but if we don't do it, higher deficits are going to imply crowding out of growth, unsustainable debt crisis, and eventually, in my view, monetization. We want to avoid those things from happening. Wow. So I think this has been a tremendous food for thought, uh, Nouriel. Uh, I also liked very much, and I think I'm very grateful to you that you took the extra time or gave us the extra time to uh, talk more about the book today than you could yesterday. Uh, to also uh, display this um, message that you see it as a wake-up call to bring things together and to yeah. create some dynamic. Uh, I think that's very important. Thank you very much for that. Also, uh, thank you to Axel. I think uh, it's been great that we have been able to engineer or you've been able to engineer this brief uh, reunion um, along the way between a crisis and uh, some crisis solution, at least in the somewhat smaller world of banking against uh, the whole planet, but still um, good examples. So thank you. Uh, please join me in a round of applause for our two guests today. Thank you.